Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual event series. My name is Cleo Migama. I'm a third year medical student at Liberty University College of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'll be your host for this evening's program. Our guest today is Dr. Daniel Clearfield, who is a primary care sports medicine specialist. He's board certified in family medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine, and he also has a fellowship in sports medicine. Dr. Clearfield owns his private practice at Motion is Medicine in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas. And he's also the Olympic team physicians for the US wrestling and judo teams. It would take a whole hour so we could list all of his achievements and certifications today. So without further ado, Dr. Clearfield, thank you so much for your time and welcome to the virtual event series. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so uh, want me to go right into my, my part of the talk? Yes, sir. You can take it away. Gotcha. Let me uh, let me open my thing up over here. And uh, crap, did I screen share? I did not screen share yet. Let me close this out real fast. Oh, good old Zoom. Um, where's my Zoom menu? All right. Uh, share screen. That one there. Okay. All right, so should be able to see the presentation now? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so um, uh, this is a presentation that I've given uh, um, numerous different times now, and I've really been refining it over the years. Um, uh, so I, you know, I know that we had like, I guess, one different kind of topic, you know, talking about direct specialty care, but um, really, uh, you know, looking at a lot of the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute and what I've been trying to do with my model, because uh, I know that I'm sure in the Benjamin Rush Institute, you've been introduced to direct primary care and some of the aspects of that. But outside of that, once you get into specialties and subspecialties, how can we kind of still escape this system of medicine that's just essentially just disheartening and beating us down and I, um, just, you know, morally just, uh, um, it's, it's just ruining medicine. And so this is my model that I've come up with in the sports medicine kind of thing. And uh, so let me just kind of get into that. So um, my big objectives are learn why you should start your own practice, understand what questions to answer before you start your own practice, know what is needed and learn some pearls and know how to sustain it. So uh, my roadmap is uh, um, I started out as a kinesiology major in college. Uh, that's what got me interested in sports medicine. Um, I got my uh, DO degree as well as my master's uh, in clinical research and education in OMM from uh, um, UNT uh, Health Science Center, TCOM over in Fort Worth. Um, I did an OMM pre-doctoral fellowship uh, from 2004 to 6 while I was at TCOM as well. Then I did a family medicine and OMM residency uh, in uh, a doctor's hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And then I did my primary care sports medicine fellowship. at a, It was an AOA accredited program as well over at uh, um, Atlantic Health uh, um, at Overlook Hospital in uh, um, 2010 and 2011. Um, I was part of the uh, faculty over at uh, TCOM, my, my alma mater from uh, 2011 to 16. Uh, I was in the Department of Orthopedics there and I also started a primary care sports medicine fellowship while I was there. Um, I left, uh, lots of different reasons I left, but I, um, I left and I went into a private practice from two, in 2016. And there were a lot of things that were kind of promised to me in that private practice kind of setting that never really, you know, again, there was a, a lot of bait and switch kind of stuff that kind of happened in that setting, even though I was trying to be very careful and I was very cognizant to watch out for those kind of things. And a lot of red flags that I saw, not to mention, I just saw that I had a lack of autonomy of being able to treat my patients the best in, in the best way that I wanted to. And so that's why I decided to start my own practice in uh, February of 2019. So I'm almost at four years now. So the big million dollar question is, should you go into your own practice? And so questions that you should be asking yourself are, are you happy with the direction of healthcare? And again, if you're a student, sometimes you haven't been disillusioned by it. But a lot of times I say that, you know, uh, we spend, you know, a lot of our formative years, it's like, uh, you know, spent my entire twenties pretty much in the classroom, learning in the classroom, in the clinic, in the hospital, learning how to be a physician, learning how to take care of people, dedicating all that time, uh, effort, and, uh, and also money. I'm not done with my loan repayments at this point, too. And so, um, you know, so once you get 
at the end point and you're like, oh, good, I'm finally a doctor. I can finally do this and this and this. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, crap, you know, this isn't, we learned this in medical school. We learned this in residency on how we should practice medicine. But then we kind of see that healthcare is not necessarily that because it's becoming this business kind of model. So you see that there's different people and I'll talk about that. So again, are we happy with the direction of healthcare? Are you happy with your work-life balance? You know, it's like, uh, I've got four kids. And so I want to make sure that I can uh, um, spend quality time with them. Do you have the autonomy you wish to have? Are you practicing medicine the way you feel is best for you and your patients? And one thing that I tell my, uh, my students and my mentees to do is, you know, it's like you write your personal statement as a medical student. You should be revamping it as you kind of go through residency. And especially if you're applying to fellowships or anything like that. Go back and look at your personal statement from time to time and see, is your compass still pointed in that right direction? Are you still gearing towards what you were hoping to kind of do medically, uh, professionally, personally? And at the same time, if it's changed, if your direction has changed, are you happy with the reason that it's changed? Or have you been kind of molded into something that has disallowed you to kind of move in that direction? Um, do you have potential for advancement with your current job? Where do you see yourself in five years? What about 10 years? Is it at the same job? If it's not, then are, is there a reason that you're hesitating on kind of leaving? Are you concerned about the stability of your job, of being replaced? And that's definitely, a, you know, there's a huge threat to medicine right now also uh, within a system because uh, um, there's a lot of mid-level encroachment that we see. And so uh, sometimes we see that we're being replaced by, uh, you know, nurse practitioners or physician assistants because they come in at a lesser dollar amount. And despite the fact that they have lesser training, they're essentially being plugged in in place of us. And so uh, there's a lot of ER docs and other docs that are kind of having that as a threat to them as well. And it's not to say that we can't all work together, but as far as replacing the, you know, the quality of a physician, uh, you can't replace the quality of a physician. So what medicine really should be, again, it should be the doctor, it should be the patient sitting across from them. And what medicine is now is it's, you know, all these different things that have kind of gotten in the way um, in between the doctor and the patient. So, so many different hiccups within the system of healthcare right now. And again, calling it healthcare is almost just a joke, just because again, it's a, it's a business. It's a business of medicine now. So why, how did this happen? And so, you know, we used to run practices. And so as it became more complicated and patients got more complex, we handed the reins of the business end so that we could focus on patient care. And that's a threat. If anybody ever approaches you uh, in a private practice and they say, let me take over all the business stuff so that you could focus on patient care. That's usually a red flag that they're going to screw some stuff up within your practice. When you hand that autonomy over of how it's being run, very often you're losing your autonomy of how you're going to be able to provide that care to the patients too. So hospital CEOs, insurance companies, all these different people that kind of have monetized medicine and see the monetary opportunity uh, that are not involved in direct patient care. They capture a large portion of each transaction between the patient and the physician. And so because of that, we've seen healthcare costs go up and we've also seen quality go down. So what do patients want? So in general, patients want quality care. They want time to spend with their doctor. They want timeliness and being seen. They want availability of their doctor, understanding of their conditions, communication with their team. They wanna be able to get in nice and easy. As far as physicians, what do we want? So we wanna be able to provide this quality care. We wanna be able to spend time with our patients. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we're just not so behind that we're stressed out. We want availability to see our patients, time to explain their conditions, communication with the health team. We want ease of them getting in to be seen. And personally, what I wanted was, I wanted the ability to offer, again, quality patient care. And the two biggest things that I say that I wanted uh, when I started my practice was, um, I want autonomy to be able to run my practice and you know, provide the care for my patients the way that I saw fit. But I also wanted me to have uh, the autonomy to be able to maximize my time with my family also. Because again, you only get to see them grow up once. So what did I feel? So kind of being in the system, um, I felt trapped in a system that was showing no signs of improving. I kept getting things dangled. You get things dangled in front of you, okay? Like a dog on a race, you know? It's like, oh, just wait until this, wait until that. We're gonna have this, we're gonna have that. And nothing was happening. So my options were, um, you know, I could stay in a family uh, medicine setting where I would not be fairly compensated 
and I could be encouraged not to manage my patients. So in the setting that, I, so initially I was in the orthopedic department academically over at the medical school. And so I was actually fairly, pretty fairly compensated, but I had very little autonomy as to how I could see my patients, what I could do with them. Um, when I went into a family medicine setting, had a little bit more autonomy as far as how I could do certain things for my patients, but I was reimbursed at a family medicine rate. And, and so family medicine, you know, uh, they typically will contract for in, in the setting of a specialty like sports medicine, I should be contracted at sports medicine or orthopedic rates, not at family medicine rates. And so pretty much I was getting paid pennies on the dollar for procedures that I do, but I was getting paid very well for evaluation and management. And so if you're getting paid well for evaluation and management, pretty much that means that if you want to be able to make a lot of money, then you should not manage your patients. It should be that it's really, you're getting paid more for evaluation. You see them and then you send them out to somebody else and you have numbers. It's a numbers game. Get as many people in as possible and then you're going to make money. But then I don't really have management of my patients. And that's something that I really am prideful of being able to take care of my patients. And so um, pretty much that was a system that wasn't going to work for me. Um, I could join an ortho group where I would likely be at the bottom of the totem pole. I could, it would lack, I would lack autonomy, but I could be compensated fairly. I could also do it myself and just, you know, go out in my own practice, but I could contract with insurers. But ultimately, if I contract with insurers or other kind of groups, then that would also be things that would influence and dictate the care that I'm able to provide to my patients. Or I could exit the system and I could take health care back. And that's what I did. So my model, the Moshe's medicine model. So we are cash pay, no insurance, out of network. And I always tell my patients, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're out of network so that we can provide you better care. So we're not using your insurance, but you can still do it. So we still provide them with a super bill that has all the proper codes. You know, I'm very good at billing and coding. I actually have taught nationally on proper billing and coding. So I know how to do that. And at the same time, I wasn't getting paid fairly. And so pretty much I have eliminated that entire aspect of trying to collect. And so more, I'm like, okay, here, you can collect. Here's what I think is fair. And then if you're able to get anything back from your insurance, then go ahead. And so as long as they're not Medicare, Medicaid, they can submit it to their insurance. Uh, so from a direct primary care standpoint, it's more of a variant model of direct primary care. And so um, I learned a lot from a lot of the um, big people in direct primary care. So um, uh, notably, I, um, oh my God, I'm <laughs> totally, uh, good Lord. I, um, Atlas MD is my uh, EMR that I use. And I, um, Josh, uh, oh my God, why am I blinking on his last name right now? Here, help me out for a second. I know, I know we know it. I know his last name, but I'm also blanking on it. And I, I, know, wanna, I, it's, I don't want to butcher his last name. If you ask me in like a minute, you know, but anyways, he's been fantastic and he's been very helpful. At the same time, he was trying to give me a lot of aspects of primary care, direct primary care. And I was like, you know, that model doesn't work as well if you're in a specialty kind of setting. So, but there's a lot of things that I do use of that direct primary care model. And so, um, uh, so, you know, uh, so membership is not as applicable. We do have some, some direct specialty care options, but, uh, um, you know, and we do, you know, I am able to get like great deals on labs, meds, imaging, all those kind of things. So my model is I see a patient for a condition, I diagnose, provide a treatment plan, patient gets better, patients discharge for their condition, and patient hopefully refers friends and family. So I am constantly marketing and I'm constantly trying to get new patients in. If you do what I do, sports medicine, okay, which is almost a uh, you know, misnomer, it, it really is more movement medicine, hence our name motion is medicine. Um, just because we're trying to get people moving, we're trying to get people active, we're trying to keep people active. And so if I'm good at what I do, you shouldn't need to have to keep coming back in to see me. And so really, so from a membership based kind of model doesn't lend entirely towards that, but I do have some aspects that I'll share that I do with it. So, and I always say, this is not a new model of medicine. This is the old model, but with today's technology. And so it's before, you know, we handed all the reins over to all these other kind of companies. So my practice before was based off the number of patients I could see, you know, often had to bring patients back for procedures, couldn't do it in the same day. We had to get prior authorizations, which is just its own migraine, just even saying those, you know, two words on many procedures. And you had to go through this tiered system to get certain treatments approved. Uh, insurances, again, would reimburse extremely poorly for procedures and sometimes not reimbursed at all. 
And again, I have taught nationally on how to bill. And so I, you know, it wasn't an issue of me billing incorrectly. The issue was the system and not the way I was practicing. So my practice now is about the quality of care. So I have what I wanted, the time to do evaluation and procedure in the same visit. Um, I, in general, I do a lot less steroid injections, corticosteroid injections now, just because I can really talk to my patients and really have a shared, you know, uh, you know, shared conversation about what their options are and they can make the best informed decision for themselves. And so we don't have to go through that tiered system of, oh, have you had an x-ray? Have you had a steroid? Have you done six weeks of physical therapy? If we think that this is the best thing and evidence even shows that this is the best thing, then pretty much that, you know, we learned in medical school, this is the progression we should go through. So that's what we go through, not what the system has dictated. Also, um, anytime that you go outside of insurance, you know, if, if, if you're in the medical system, and I grew up in the medical system, so my father uh, was uh, chair of the internal medicine department at uh, TCOM for uh, two and a half decades, and the last 15 years of his career, he was the dean over at Turo, California. So I've been in the medical system and around medicine my entire life. I grew up, you know, where doctors would help other doctors out and everything like that. And I also grew up where, you know, it's like, I mean, a lot of times, when you're in the insurance system, if you're like, oh, uh, you know, you don't have to, I, I don't feel like charging you today, or I, let me give you a discount. You can't give a discount. You can't do any kind of promotion or discount or anything like that if you're doing it within the confines of insurance. Uh, that's illegal and that's fraud. And you could actually go to jail for that, um, which is a BS kind of thing because there's plenty of other systems that do those kind of things. But that's, that's the, the rule uh, that you're kind of playing by. So once you go out of that system, I can do it. So I have promotions several times a year. We have discounts for several different kind of subgroups of individuals to you know, show our appreciation for them. And so we're able to do that just because we're outside of that model. Again, autonomy to run the practice the way I want to. So let's talk about some pros and cons. So I can take off when I want. But at the same time, you know, I always say there's no paid time off when you're your own boss you're only, it's only time off. And so that said, I'm, I, I continuously work on more passive income opportunities so that I'm able to make money when I'm not in the office. Uh, there's no bureaucracy to get things done, but at the same time, you do need to be able to watch your spending, you know, and you gotta be careful with overhead. Um, I can run the business the way I want, but I do have to run a business. And so you have to say to yourself, is that something that I wanna do? Or maybe, I, you know, we could find ourselves to be employed under another now if you want to be employed under another physician versus a corporation that's another thing to be careful of because we are seeing corporations buy up direct primary care clinics and then what once again you're going to see that same kind of thing as far as you're losing the autonomy and so you got to be careful so just because it's direct primary care doesn't mean it's an autonomous clinic for you to be able to practice however you want those companies are looking to make money and they don't have the patient's interest typically at their forefront like we would and they take advantage of that I can charge what I want to charge, but at the same time, I need to make money. And that's something that I've really had to kind of think about. And we constantly uh, sit down, uh, we readjust, we look at inflation, we try to uh, make sure, is our prices fair? Are our prices going to be a deterrent for people coming in? Are our price, you know, just the art of uh, finding the right price is uh, important as well. Because I always say, if you buy uh, an item from the dollar store for a dollar, and if you buy the same item from uh, um, uh, Bloomingdale's or something like that for $50. Even if it's the same item, I guarantee you're going to take better care of that $50 item that you purchased than the other. So price does come with value. If you give somebody something for free or for pennies on the dollar, they're going to treat it like that. They're not going to respect the care that you're giving them. So it is important to find out what the cost threshold is to have a placebo effect and for people to put value to the care that you have. And so that's a whole psychology of the system uh, also that you have to kind of figure out. So I'm not gonna go through all these, but just kind of highlighting some of the different steps. So you have to you know, figure out your name, establish an identity. Um, my website, and I'll show you my website a little bit later, um, has been a huge thing as far as uh, you know, self-marketing, getting people in here, getting people to know about my practice. And everybody that's listening to this, if you haven't been to my website, if you haven't subscribed to my social media, then do it now. Um, uh, location, you know, is the number one law of real estate, but at the same time, as you get started, you know, make sure that you don't put yourself in a bad situation. So I subleased out of another practice and we had a pretty nice arrangement as I kind of got started where, um, I, um, I was just because you're not busy when you typically get started, even if you think you're going to be busy, I thought I was going to be totally busy and I was definitely wrong with that. 
And so um, uh, when you do get started, uh, subleasing was a great option. The arrangement that I had was pretty much um, it, we just paid a percentage of our total earnings to them. So it wasn't like I had a specific rent check that I had to kind of give to them. It was the more successful I was, the more they were. And they were just, they, these were rooms that they just weren't even using. So it was just essentially passive income for them. But at the beginning, if I saw zero patients and made zero dollars, I paid zero rent. But then if I made $10,000 and I'm paying them 40%, then they're making $4,000. And so after a certain amount of time, when we started doing really well, that's where we realized we're paying them a lot more in rent than we would if we were just renting or, you know, than we would if we're just typically renting. And that's when we realized we were ready to kind of branch off. We had that. And so it was good to be able to do that. So marketing, and again, I'll talk, touch on marketing. Uh, EMR, I mentioned that, uh, you know, it's like I have a direct primary care based EMR, um, uh, which is uh, Atlas MD. I uh, um, coming up with a business plan, uh, looking at supplemental income also. So um, when I started this, and again, I've been in practice for, um, uh, when I started this, I've been in practice a little over eight years. And um, I, you know, already been kind of well, uh, you know, the, the community knew me well as a sports medicine physician. Uh, that said, I, um, again, I wasn't as busy as I was hoping. And so um, I went back and I taught at the medical school some, and I also um, had to moonlight at urgent care, which was just, uh, I hated it, but it kept the doors open. So your business plan, uh, you know, you, you need this for bank loans. You should have established short and long-term goals. These are all things that you should figure out before you look to try to do your own practice. Uh, have a mission statement, come up with a budget, really try to figure out like what the initial investment is to start up. Um, think about, you know, how much profit you're going to make uh, when you anticipate hitting your goals. Uh, make sure you come up with a marketing plan and budget for that, because again, you need to get the word out about yourself. So marketing, you know, different things that we kind of hit up. So in the medical end, you know, all these different kind of people. So uh, direct primary care docs are great, primary care physicians, uh, physical therapists, notably those that use, uh, utilize direct access, um, chiro uh, chiropractors, Arosti um, practices. Um, standalone emergency departments was a little bit easier than hospital-based ones because very often hospital-based ones want you to be connected within an insurance plan or they want you to be part of a hospital system. And a lot of times you need to be on insurance plans to be a part of a hospital system or you have to pay a big sum for there. And so again, um, urgent care is just another great one. Um, but again, if they're plugged in within a system, sometimes that makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, specialists again, so I utilize, you know, do I get a ton from ortho, but I show them, I show ortho some of the things that maybe they don't like to treat that I can take care of. Uh, uh, neurology, I do a lot of uh, nerve based kind of procedures also. And so I, um, from a, even from a gastrointestinal, I'm become like this national expert on this condition called anterior abdominal cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. And I have people that fly all over the country to come and see me for this condition. And so I get some referrals from GI doctors. I get a lot from local OMM docs. You know, I do a lot of OMM. It's the number one procedure that I do in my practice as a DO. Um, but um, so I always say, I'm not looking to take away your OMM, but people that maybe need regenerative medicine or need other nerve treatments, maybe they need diagnostic ultrasonography or neurosonography done. These are things that I can do. So I let them know about that. Um, so again, lots of different places that I get it. Also, uh, you know, we have like a few massage therapy places that send us a lot of patients. Uh, we always joke that uh, CrossFit is great for business. Uh, um, the new one that's great for business is pickleball. So I need to figure out because uh, pickleball is becoming a big sport. And at the same time, I see, I see so many pickleball injuries because people love it. They overplay it and then they get injured. Um, also, you know, being sports medicine, I hit a lot of running stores. I see a lot of runners. Other things, um, you know, so from a local coverage, so I cover high schools, um, I have relationships with colleges, I work different mass participation events. Um, I do, uh, you know, I'm a team physician with our Olympics and USA Wrestling and USA Judo, and I do uh, USA Volleyball when they come to town as well. And so, um, you know, there's potential opportunities for marketing through those kind of things. Sometimes I gain patience from it, sometimes I more just get the word out about me. Um, first responders, dance studios, golf clubs, small businesses, labor intensive companies, um, other things like, you know, um, I have done a little bit through the Chamber of Commerce. I didn't find that to be as fruitful as some other people have. Um, I did a lot of local networking groups as I got started. I kind of phased that out where I, I haven't seen as much return on investment with that. 
Um, as far as TV, radio spots, interviews, I've done a handful of those. Um, Esports facilities is another one I'm trying to tap more into, as well as some senior centers. Um, internal marketing. So when people come in, have some of the stuff on display so that they can see, because I can't tell you how many times people come in, they're like, oh, I didn't know that you took care of this, this, and this. Or I see them, you know, I see them with a boot on their foot. I go, oh, what's going on there? And like, oh, you know, I saw my podiatrist for this. I go, you know, I can take care of that. They're like, oh, I had no idea. And so they need to be reminded about the diversity of things. I always say I treat from toes to nose. So, um, you know, there's very little that I'm not able to treat. So if it doesn't move the right way and if it's hurting or if it's not functioning the right way, I can treat that. I can work on that. So we have videos displaying a lot of you know, different marketing videos that I've made for social media or just uh, YouTube uh, that are, we have looping in our, uh, um, in our lobby. Uh, we have lots of different displays, brochures out in our exam room. Also, we have you know, displays, brochures out there. Um, social media. And so, um, again, I encourage my our handle is uh, um, at motion is med. So I encourage, you know, on all these different things, you know, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, any of these things, please follow us. Uh, it helps it helps us, uh, um, you know, kind of grow that. And um, does that equal getting some people in? Um, yes, over time it will. It's a, you know, social media is definitely a, so, a slow thing that kind of eventually gains steam, but it also gets you better about talking about your procedures. It gets you better about talking about who you are, what you do. And it also, um, uh, it creates more con marketing content for you as well. Um, you know, so that we have those videos that can look through and play in the lobby as people are waiting or maybe a family member sitting out there and they're watching and they're like, oh, I should come in for this or, oh, my brother has this or my uncle or whatever. So it's also important to have like a call to action. So, you know, that's something that I have to remind myself. And I have actually trained my uh, administrative assistant front desk person to kind of do a lot of our social media posts. But is there a call to action in there? So today we posted about my talk that I'm doing here right now. And we have a call to action at the end. So the website, and again, I encourage all of you to um, you know, go there, explore, look around on it. Because again, I've put a lot of work into it and I continuously work on it. Actually, when we get done and my kids go to sleep tonight, I'm going to work on my website a little bit more. Um, so you need to make sure you get a server domain. Um, I actually found like, like through uh, my buddy um, that I've known since a uh, third year of med school, um, uh, he found this one guy over in India uh, who's been amazing as far as developing my website. And so I was getting quotes from a lot of people that were here. And it's like, oh, my brother will hook you up, you know, and it was like his prices were insane. And then uh, this guy in India, you know, it's like he does an absolutely fantastic job and it's for a fraction of the cost um, just because he doesn't have to have that American markup essentially. And so uh, he's done a fantastic job and I've turned a lot of people on to him. I uh, need to do things like create keywords, uh, videos also help attract patients. So there's lots of different things that you do to optimize your website. Um, you wanna make sure that you have a good functional flow. Um, some of the big you know, website things that have been very helpful are like having conditions that I treat on there, uh, what procedures and services that we do. Um, as far as search engine optimization, the SEO, uh, let me see. Uh, the SEO it is one thing so that you kind of get to that number one spot on Google when people are searching for you. And so you want it to be. So if people look up and they're like sports medicine, Fort Worth or North Richland Hills or wherever is Daniel Clearfield or motion is medicine. Is that what's popping up first? And so that's part of the goal of what you're trying to kind of accomplish with that. I saw a patient today that said, uh, I was like, how did you find us? And he said, oh, I Googled PRP because I heard that could be a treatment that could help me. And I found your site and I went to it. I looked, I read your reviews, all those things. And it was, um, I liked what I saw. I liked what I read. I liked your philosophy. I, you know, so he really, you know, went through my stuff. And so my efforts that I've done to kind of create all this has been very fruitful. So your online reputation does make a difference. It does help. And so uh, the one thing that, you know, we actually just had a discussion on this private practice physicians group that I'm on is, uh, you know, it's like, do we need to kind of uh, be, uh, do we need to cater to some of these patients that threaten bad reviews? And you know what? Uh, in a, a bad review every now and then isn't even the end of the world because it makes it look, you know, because sometimes sites look almost artificially blown up. Just like Amazon will do that with, you know, they have all these bots that will have all these fault, you know, just kind of bot reviews and stuff like that. And people start to see that, well, you know, educated people are going to see that BS. Um, so if you have a bad review, not the end of the world, but try to dilute it out with all your good reviews.
um, blog also. So I'm actually um, you know, working on my latest blog right now. And so these are things that naturally boost your SEO. Uh, you can talk about things that you do in your practice. Uh, again, people are Googling these things. What's funny is I, I, um, uh, I coined this one uh, phrase called toilet knees, and that's been one of our like most famous blogs that we do. And so it's like a lot of people visit just to you know, kind of read about that because they're like, oh, yeah, I got that. So my goals as I started this, uh, you know, short term was to build a financially stable sports medicine model. Uh, uh, and I definitely did that in that time span. Uh, I'm at almost four years and by five years, our goal is to move to a larger facility. I want to add a gym, personal training, uh, expand performance and rehab services. And I'm also looking at bringing on an associate. And then long term, I'm looking at franchise and actually my national consulting service I'm working on as far as teaching other physicians and subspecialties how to kind of do this model. And so that's one thing I've been kind of you know working on. So before I started my practice, my financial advisor said, don't make any big moves. And so I, in this order, I proposed to my you know, now wife, so I'm divorced and remarried. Um, I gave notice to my salary job later that month. I got married in January of 2019. I started my practice, Moshe's Medicine, in February 2019. I had my daughter's bat mitzvah, which was a big deal and expensive as well. Went on my honeymoon. Uh, we got pregnant right after the honeymoon. Survived a pandemic. Is it done? Had another kid. And then also, you know, my wife unfortunately has had breast cancer, but she's actually doing well. She has had her last surgery this past Friday. And uh, so, you know, she's doing well, but I mean, we've dealt with all this, all this stuff. And so, uh, and I'm still here. I'm still, you know, you know, at times I say I'm treading water and, you know, people keep handing me more things, but uh, I'm still, I'm still doing okay. Um, as far as mistakes that I've made. So again, assuming I instantly be busy, all my old patients would follow me. A lot of them did, but it took some time. Uh, not having enough in savings, not being debt free before starting this. Uh, making some equipment investments too quickly and having, you know, not really having a supplemental and, and or spousal income. But I'd say the biggest mistake was not doing this soon enough. Other mistakes that I've heard from other people, you know, sponsoring local teams. If you do, make sure you can get out in front of the athletes, uh, newspaper ads, sending out mailers. As far as things on the win column, so uh, you know we brought on initially uh, our front desk was an intern that was pre med, and so they worked for less money because they wanted to learn, and we gave them that opportunity. So it was a win win for both of us. Uh, I hired an athletic trainer who's been fantastic. Um, you know, it's like uh, again, I've sponsored some triathlons and running clubs that I have been able to get in front of them, and I've gotten a lot of patients from them. Um, other things, I, I have like a marketing materials. We have a whole marketing packet that is very helpful that kind of shows and highlights all the different things that we do. Uh, we have a referral sheet that kind of lists the procedures that I do. And, uh, you know, notably, um, my wife is very active on this one group called Colleyville Moms. Uh, that's, uh, you know, Colleyville, Texas is right next to us here. And we see a lot of patients through Colleyville Moms. There's like, I mean, thousands of women on there and they're all saying, who do I go for this? Who do I go for this? And so you want your name to be reflected good on there. And so again, little networks like that, we see a lot of patients that self-refer just from that alone. So I'm just going to try to, you know, finish up over here kind of quick. So other tidbits of advice. Uh, you want to make sure you're being you know, outgoing in your community, market frequently, again, sublease until you're doing well enough to move to your own place and pay people to stay. If you want people to, you know, you want people to feel rewarded, uh, you want them to feel respected. And so you want to make sure that you're doing all that. OK, and again, talking about going back to that personal statement, never lose sight of why you did this. So, again, I have these things that I wanted. OK, I actually need to update the picture because I. Um, I, um, so, you know, it's like my athletic trainer, actually, she's going to be leaving. I'm bringing on a new athletic trainer and, I, um, uh, Candy, my administrative assistant is not the girl that's in the picture. <laughs> that's our, uh, that's our old intern. So I need to update that picture. Um, sometimes I don't always say the smartest thing. So this is me back in medical school, uh, saying to my best friend, uh, the key is that you understand me, not that I understand you very deep, profound, you know, immature, stupid medical student statement. OK, but um, this is something that I said to uh, one of my colleagues when I was working the Olympic trials. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to say no to the professional so you can say yes to the personal. 
And uh, he really thought that was pretty profound. And I was like, yeah, that is kind of profound. And I reflect back on that. And so sometimes you do have to learn how to say no uh, to certain things so that you can say yes to the more important things. And again, uh, making sure that I'm there for my family is my number one priority. And so uh, this picture is a little bit outdated now. You know, it's like, so the, uh, the baby just turned two. Uh, my oldest is 16. My uh, son is 10. My adult, other daughter is seven. And uh, that's uh, Captain Cody, our dog, right over there. So, all right. So more information just about the practice over here. Again, we're over in North Richland Hills, Texas, if anybody's local and you know, needs a sports medicine doc. And again, once uh, again, here is our uh, um, social media handles here. So um, I'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> well, Dr. Clearfield, thank you so much. I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I feel like you have such a, a deep knowledge on all those things and just hearing from you is so, so encouraging as, as I can speak for myself, of course. As I go through this uh, medical school journey, sometimes feels so tiring, like we study so much. And as you mentioned, like we invest so much of our time today, uh, but seeing the joy that you have and all that you have accomplished so far with your clinic, uh, it's inspiring uh, and, and helps me dream. And I'm sure other students watching and other uh, people watching too, that like it's possible to, to be successful and to do something that's personal and, and get the great achievements that that we can get through that. Like it's a beautiful career and we got in for a reason. And I don't think it's fair that uh, we, we lose sight of what's really important. Like what you mentioned, like with the personal statement because we're so busy just checking boxes. Uh, we do have questions and if it's okay with you, I'm gonna read some of yeah. them. So first question, do patients at your practice and clinic have to pay more money out of pocket if they can't afford the services you provide? So, yeah, good question. And, you know, is our model perfect for everybody? Is it universal for everybody? Just like direct primary care. There are some people that can't afford, you know, the, the, the payment for direct primary care. It's about, you know, prioritizing. If you, you know, the, the thing I compare it to is, you know, a, a lot of times we talk about like uh, car maintenance and car insurance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like uh, with car insurance, do you, every time you get a, um, you need an oil change or you get a flat tire, do you use your car insurance? No. You pay that money. Why? Do you because you value your car? You put worth to your car. You realize what's going to happen to your car. And so, health insurance should be the same kind of way. Now, I use my car insurance if I blow my engine out, if I uh, am in a catastrophic kind of accident. So, if I have a serious, you know, like a, you know, like I break my hip or something like that. If I have a very expensive kind of thing, I do have in you know catastrophic insurance to be able to kind of take care of those kind of things. But otherwise, I just pay out of pocket for my expenses. So yes, sometimes our prices are a little bit out of reach for certain kind of individuals. That said, we try to say that we don't want price to get in the way of quality care. And so we say, you know, we're transparent. This is how much it's going to cost. Uh, if people are, you know, uh, you know, some we have worked out payment plans for certain kind of things, notably the more expensive procedures. So if somebody needs platelet-rich plasma and they can't afford to pay all of it, but they can afford to pay some of it, as long as we can make sure that we're not going to just lose money over the, uh, the issue, then we can work on that. And so we, uh, we individualize it for that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it doesn't appeal to everybody. There's definitely some people that maybe are on a lesser income, but at the same time, there are free clinics that are available for people like that, that don't have insurance or have crappy insurance and they don't have, and they need to have better access for something. There are clinics that they can still go to. Yeah, thank you so much, it makes total sense. Uh, one simple question is like, I know I have a lot of friends who are interested in sports medicine. And when I first heard, I had no clue if it's something that's like its own thing, is it through something else? Could you quickly just share with us what's the pathway of becoming a sports medicine physician? Okay. And that, that, again, I, and I see a question about getting involved in the Olympics. And again, like these are entirely this, I have a, other lectures that entirely center on just kind of those kind of things. But as far as sports medicine is a specialty. And so there's uh, different paths in the sports medicine. So I do primary care sports medicine. There's six different paths currently that you can do to get into primary care sports medicine. So you can do it from family medicine. You can do it from internal medicine. You can do it from pediatrics. You can do it from emergency medicine, you can do it from physiatry, PMNR, or you can do it from NMM, OMM, neuromuscular medicine, osteopathic manipulative medicine. Those are the six different paths. Probably the most traditional path is like what I did, family medicine. But I, um, I, there are plenty of people that have done other kinds of specialties that kind of go in there. 
Uh, physiatry, PM&R, does have their own sports medicine fellowship available as well. So it's just, uh, it's, uh, just essentially physiatry sports medicine. Uh, neurology also has their own sports medicine fellowship. Uh, I believe there's only one up in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, then orthopedics also, after completing a orthopedic surgery residency, you can do a sports medicine fellowship. And those tend to be, you know, like they tend to get a little bit of that background of some of the primary care stuff, but for the most part, they are tend to be arthroscopy based fellowships. So a lot of times they have a high emphasis on arthroscopy of the knee of the uh, shoulder. And then a lot of them are starting to incorporate things on like uh, arthroscopy of the hip, sometimes the elbow. All right. All right. Do you have, like, are you going to tackle anything with the Olympics or should we defer that to another time where they could reach out to you or look at other lectures? Uh, that I, I guess the, the quick thing I, I just say on getting involved with like the Olympics and everything is, um, you know, pretty much if you want to do that, you probably, you almost definitely need to do a sports medicine fellowship these days. Some mm -hmm. grandfather people back uh, from before the sports medicine fellowship times have been able to kind of get it incorporated but definitely having the background of a sports medicine fellowship, I think is pretty critical for understanding the diversity of different things. Um, you, uh, the Olympic Training Center has uh, um, its own criteria for um, accepting applications for people to apply to become an Olympic team physician. And pretty much just like as you, as a medical student, you'll go out and do audition rotations for residency, you essentially do an audition rotation for them. So you go out there and you can make sure that you play well with them and their rules and uh, make sure that you, uh, um, you know, get along well with the athletes, that you know your stuff. And so they kind of test your merits like that. Um, so um, that was something I did my uh, um, Olympic rotation in 2013. So I've been out of practice for uh, two years. I, um, before I was uh, um, eligible and selected to be able to come out for that. Um, as far as work, working with national governing bodies like USA Wrestling, USA Judo, uh, USA Volleyball, uh, some of its opportunity, I, um, I, just through connections I had through the AOASM, um, that's how I got plugged in with USA Volleyball. Um, connections I had uh, with uh, um, just local people that did uh, Judo that happened to be athletes within the USA Judo community. That's how I got plugged in with that. And then USA Wrestling, I had a, um, I had some other mentors that were involved with USA Wrestling, and I essentially solicited uh, um, some USA Wrestling events and just said, "Hey, um, I can come out, I can help." Um, I was a wrestler myself, and so you know, be, knowing the sport, and then I went out and worked those events mm -hmm. and uh, did well while I was out there. And so, um, uh, notably with USA Wrestling, the first event I worked, we had a, a significant spinal injury that occurred, and I took the lead on that. And the report got back to USA Wrestling, and it was about like a couple days after the event that they called me up and said, do you want to be on our official panel? So, Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing those things. Um, another question that I had, uh, I know that your practice is marketed as a sports medicine primary care. Uh, I guess just for people that are listening to, do you have to be an athlete to join? And also another question, do you also take care through your family medicine education and training? Do you also take care of family medicine primary care related concerns, or do you mainly just choose to focus on uh, sports and procedures and uh, things like that? Sure. And so, um, <clears throat> so the way I always talk about family medicine to me is that you know uh, I, I I call family medicine like a friend I have on Facebook that I'm like, hey man, how you doing? And they're like, good. And they're like, hey, we should hang out. Like, nah, you know. <laughs> It's like, I, I'm, I'm cool with family medicine. I like, you know, we could, we could hang out every now and then, but I don't want to like hang out with family medicine every day. And then sports medicine is I'm in a relationship with sports medicine. So, um, you know, this is really what my passion is about. And then some people really still have that passion to have that meld of primary care and sports medicine. And I say to each their own, um, there's plenty to learn just in the world of primary care sports medicine. That said, having my entire background within primary care makes me such a well-rounded sports medicine physician. So I can see cardiac, I can see pulmonary, I can see dermatologic, I can see so much beyond just the typical orthopedic kind of injury. And so that also makes me a lot more unique in my community because the other sports medicine doctors are mainly orthopedic. And so they're a little bit more restrictive of what they're able to kind of see, what they're able to kind of do. Um, so uh, as far as, uh, you know, do you have to be an athlete? And I, one thing I always say is um, all, everybody that moves as an athlete, we just have varying levels of athletes. And so um, I see, you know, five years old and up. And so 
Um, you know, it's like I see plenty of kids, but I see lots of adults. Um, you know, so I think I don't think I've ever treated anybody over 100, but you know, we just uh, we just did a stem cell procedure on an 84 year old lady that's just trying to stay active and do her walks and everything like that. Um, you know, we'll see the kid, you know, the five year old kid that has the, the torus fracture on the wrist. We'll see the uh, the 16 year old with their concussion. We'll see the 25 year old, you know, with the weightlifting shoulder. We'll see the uh, 35 year old, you know, that has the overuse injury. So again, it's like we see that full variety, and just like in primary care, where you see pretty much cradle to grave. I see cradle to grave of those sports medicine based kind of complaints. But as far as managing primary care, I'm not typically, you know, I'm not doing like managing their diabetes. I partner with their primary care physician. I try to make sure that they get in with a primary care physician. If they don't have one, I have a whole list that I send to them that I have ready to go. Just at Atlas, I have a whole uh, macro phrase for it. It just shows up geographically. Here's family docs, here's pediatricians, here's internal medicine doctors that I recommend so that they can have quality primary care. And I have a lot of DPCs that are on that list. Gotcha, thank you so much. That makes absolutely sense. And that's, well, thank you. Um, talking about DPC, how did you manage to get discounts? I know we mentioned uh, Atlas MD, and I think Chris mentioned his name with us. I don't want to mispronounce, but Umber, that's his last yeah, name. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. I kept I going to say gonna... after, and I was like, that was my realtor when I was in Ohio. Um, yeah, Josh Umber, yeah. And uh, so, and you know, Josh has done a fantastic job with what he's done. So Josh, I think is, uh, he was a year behind me in training, pretty much straight mm -hmm. after he finished residency. He was exposed to DPC and then he started DPC right uh, right out of the uh, thing. So he's been doing it longer than, uh, you know, I've had my own practice. And so he has had a lot of trials, tribulations to learn that. And then his brother does like the tech end of things. And so his brother design, helped design most of the EMR. And then uh, his father is the legal end of it. And his father's the attorney. So, you know, they're kind of like this three-headed dragon that uh, is just killing it with the uh, DPC, so... That's nice and good for them. I feel like a lot of doctors that I have met that are doing DPC now, more often than not, I have heard them talk about Atlas MD as their EMR of choice. And they only have highest of phrases to talk about it. And I've only heard good things. Uh, that's above my pay grade today, but I've only heard great things about Atlas MD. Um, but regarding uh, direct primary care, a lot of doctors, so they have that membership model and they have a a lower panel of patients. And with that, my understanding was with that lower, with that panel of patients, they're constantly their own, um, always there paying the membership. I thought that's how they used to get discounted on labs and on, on imaging and things like that. Uh, but you, your story, you don't have a membership. It makes more sense for your model not to have a membership and they pay when they come to see you. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to still get discounts on labs without the membership? So you don't have to have the membership. It's more of just, these are physicians that have just gone out and independently contracted with a lab, independently contracted with um, an imaging place. So, um, you know, it's like, I just talked to other places and you can also, you know, you can use, you know, capitalism. You can say, it's like, hey, this place is offering this. Are you willing to match this? You know, I'll use you for this. Um, you know, uh, doing what I do, I don't have to do a ton of labs. So, you know, we don't need to use a lab discount that often. Um, but that said, when we do, it's nice that we have that option. Um, when, uh, but we do a lot of, uh, you know, we do have a need for a lot of imaging. So, uh, if x ray, you know, so as far as x ray, MRI, um, I looked at, you know, getting my own x ray in my practice. But right now, I have a deal where I can get an x ray done at the, the imaging place that I use, uh, is about 15 minutes away from me and we can get it done for $10 a view. So if I need three views, it's 30 bucks. So there's no way if I purchased a, a decent enough kind of digital x-ray, um, there's no way that I could have a return on investment and charge $10 a view. So, hey, you know what? I'm fine sending them out and then they can come back. They can bring me the disc. I can take a look and I'm on their portal and I can pull it up. Uh, I can get MRIs done for 275. So, I mean, fit, I mean, just crazy how much cheaper you can get it when you don't have to go through a system. And a lot of it has been, um, a lot of these prices have just been kind of wildly adjusted just because uh, insurance has just played this game of uh, back and, you know, cat and mouse back and forth. And so that's where these prices have gotten out of hand. And some places have forgotten 
oh, if we just did cash pay, we could just do this because we're still making this profit. Because maybe, you know, if I send somebody for an MRI and uh, they're using their insurance and the patient has to pay $800 out of pocket because they have that deductible and, the in, and then the imaging place is, you know, only capturing, you know, like, you know, 200 or $300 after everything is said and done, then it would have been better for them just to kind of go cash and not have to do that and wait for that. So it's, you know, they can get the cash right now. So places that will, you know, play nice with you, um, you know, that they, they work great. And so you just have to seek those out in the community. How can you partner with other places in the community? Well, thank you so much. Yeah, that makes total sense. And that's a great deal for an x-ray. I've never heard anything like that before, $10. Almost makes me want to get an x-ray. But um, yeah, I know you, you charge for a price and I'm, I don't want to miss if you get ready to mention that. Do you also offer any memberships for your patients? Because uh, I think, by the, I love your website and I was playing on it uh, earlier today and seeing the services you provide and it's incredibly well done. And I thought I saw something about direct specialty care that yeah. patients that come just for OMM or anything. Are those kind of like a, if we can call it a membership? Yeah, and so we do have those membership services available. So, um, so you know, again, what I say is like when I do OMM as opposed to like a chiropractor, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of chiropractors, it's almost taught within their education that you need chiropractic constantly to be able to survive. And I'm like, nah, you know, it's like, I mean, really, Again, if you're really using osteopathic principles when treating people with OMM, then you're able to kind of help their body find wellness and then they should be able to get better. But some people that maybe have a chronic condition that is like not necessarily curable, but it needs to be more maintained. But uh, more commonly, athlete, you know, so we have like a, um, people on a, a performance and maintenance plan with a, our uh, direct osteopathic care plan. And so with that, people just come in for a couple times a month of uh, having a uh, manipulation done. And so, uh, you know, so like some of the people, like uh, I have one person that our last patient today was on that plan. And so he is an uh, um, older gentleman, but he runs uh, competitively and OMM keeps him in shape because he always falls apart otherwise. And so OMM helps, his, uh, uh, helps him be able to maintain himself with running, but also helps him with his performance of running as well. So he says, it's like, I'm just, I'm better able to run uh, more effectively. Um, we have uh, um, one uh, um, high school athlete who is a uh, um, uh, high level, very high level dancer. And uh, OMM keeps her, uh, it helps work on prevention of injuries because she got injured a lot. And I said, maybe you should get on this plan because we kept doing OMT to help after her injury. I said, <laughs> prevention than to work on, you know, work on prevention and reaction to an injury. And so she's done fantastic on that. So uh, we have, you know, several different people that come, you know, we don't have a ton of people on that plan, but I, um, it also gives my medical students a very good opportunity to kind of keep honing their OMM skills uh, because they get a lot of opportunity to be able to do that as well. Um, we also have a, what's called my direct ortho care plan, a direct orthopedic care plan. And so uh, sometimes people come in and, you know, we see this all the time where they're like, you know, um, my neck hurts, my shoulder hurts, my back hurts, my knee hurts. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I can't solve, you know, this didn't all happen in a day. I can't solve it all in a day. We have several visits that we're going to need to do to hack away at this. And so for some people that have you know, either they're in a sport or occupation that they're going to, you know, need to probably come in for several different kinds of injuries, or maybe they have several different kinds of complaints that are going on. We get them enrolled in this direct orthopedic care plan. And so, uh, you know, we have a monthly kind of fee for that, and then it covers their, um, all their E&M visits. And then the longer that they've been enrolled in the program, uh, their discounts can go up to 25% off of our services. And so uh, also like, let's say that somebody wants a more expensive procedure, like stem cell is pretty much the most extensive, uh, expensive procedure that we do. And they're like, okay, if I'm enrolled in this plan for this much time, then I can get this much discount. So it's actually gonna make more financial sense for me to kind of get enrolled in this plan. Why, did, why would I do something like that? Well, that way I also have a passive income essentially coming in on a monthly basis. So maybe I'm not gonna capture as much off of them when they have that, but I have a, another little background that I didn't even have to work for to be able to kind of capture that in the background. So that's where I have that plan as well. So those have been the plans that have worked well for me um, well, thank you so as much. far as a direct specialty care kind of an aspect. Yeah, I because I, I saw a little bit and I'd love to hear more about how that works given like you also charge the price per visit. And, and thank you so much, makes total sense. Uh, I just have one more question due to the timing that we are catching in now. 
Uh, I love hearing about OMM. Uh, I fell in love with it in school and, and it has been a pleasure to learn and, and practice whenever possible. But for our audience that may not be as familiar, uh, would you like, or, or could you please share a little bit of what OMM is uh, and how is that different from a chiropractor? That's often a question that I, people ask me a lot too. Yeah, and the one thing that I talk about that, you know, chiropractors have done, you know, really well is they've marketed themselves well. They've really kind of, uh, um, they've learned how to really talk about what they do. And so, you know, because it's embarrassing to say that, you know, um, you know, it's like, do you know what a chiropractor does? But you know who came first? Osteopathic physicians. We came first and then the chiropractors got their ideas from osteopathic physicians and then branched off in their own different direction. You know, so for whatever reason, sometimes the word has not gotten out. Um, osteopathic philosophy is different than chiropractic philosophy. Uh, chiropractic philosophy very often focuses on a, more of a nerve based kind of philosophy as far as how the body functions, where osteopathic philosophy really centers around blood flow and the rule of the artery. And so, yeah, we need blood, uh, adequate blood flow to get oxygen, nutrients, healing factors delivered to the tissue to be able to allow it to heal. And that's a principle that I use literally with every single patient that I see thinking what is impairing their body's ability to try to heal itself. And again, while a lot of chiropractors, again, they kind of learn almost this dependent kind of model of you need manipulation to almost live. My thing is I look at the person and I try to figure out what obstruction is there in there. You know, everybody has this path of wellness that they need to walk down. Some people have deviated it off and I need to kind of redirect them there. Some people have an obstruction in the road and I need to help kind of move it out of the way. And so that's where I kind of, you know, have that approach. But again, I am typically not looking for a chronic patient. I'm looking for how can I fix this patient so that they don't need to see me anymore? How can I show that? And I, I always say, I'm not fixing them. I'm showing their body how to fix themselves. And so when I do manipulation, my purpose is to restore normal function within the individual so that they can thrive on their own because the body is capable of that. We just have to sometimes show them how to get there. Well, I've never heard a better explanation. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, sorry, what? Well, I've been doing, been doing my spiels for a while. I, I can see, I can see you said something about the stereotypes, but I think you got your marketing just nicely done. Uh, I think we're also short on time now. Uh, I would love to talk to you for hours. You have such like a wealth of knowledge and, uh, so kind, so nice to spend this time with us. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Clearfield. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And also for everyone who has been watching with us and those who unfortunately couldn't watch, but is going to look at this later. Thank you for everyone participating with us. And if we have any additional questions, uh, you can email them to chris at benjaminrushinstitute.org. Chris is C-R-I-S at benjaminrushinstitute.org. We also have down in the chat session for everyone, we share some of your uh, social media platforms, access to your website, and I would love for everyone to also contact you if that's okay. Sure. If they have any questions and would love to like hear more about your practice, what you do and, and just be more inspired by everything that you have done. Uh, and in light of just thanking everyone for participating with us, the next edition of our virtual event series will feature Dr. Amy Walsh on November 10th to delve into direct primary care as a pathway of practicing medicine. And you can also register in our website, benjaminrushinstitute.org.